If you can call dreams anything, you can call them divisive. On the one hand, you have scientists who are adamant that they are nothing more than the chaotic, white noise nonsense of the human machine, and then on the other hand, you have those who believe that you can travel to other planets using them, or heal cancer. And these two giant po polarities sit between the tension of a Jungian opposite that we have to cross if we want to understand them better and it's always irked me a bit surely there's a physiological reason to why we dream but surely there's also a reason in and of itself why we dream there's a purpose to them there's a power to them there's restriction and they're not supreme magic but there's also value in them of some sort and so in order for me to understand that i had to take a look into the neuroscience what our brain does when we sleep and abstract out of that what our dreams might be attempting to do and it always led me to ask the question how could we if through understanding what our brain is doing and modeling it does this give us a better ability to help our brains in that process that it's trying to achieve when it dreams and so if we want to understand that we have to look at a few of the things that our brain does the architecture of our brain if we will one of the most important parts of that architecture is the difference between the front and the back of our brain. You might know that you have those eyes at the front of your brain that look out into the world and see things. And what's super interesting is that your eyes take that information that they gather at the front and they send it all the way to the back, the very back, in order to process things. And this is because your eyes are sending them to the part of your brain that is designated for processing. Whereas the front of your brain is designated for active stuff, for putting stuff out into the world, for things like thinking, things like expressing, things like speaking. Whereas the back is to do with interpreting, understanding, perceiving. And this dynamic will become very important when we look at what happens when we dream. Because when we dream, we turn off much of the front of our brain. We turn off the thing for going out into the world we turn off the the, the place for thinking the and even the left brain to a large extent that, that's used for for speaking and thinking and being super logical and we allow the back of the brain to go into overdrive we allow the the visual cortex that was used for processing things to go into hyperdrive so that we churn out all those images which explains why our brain experiences dreams why we experience dreams as these visual and splendors that they're so they're so they, they imprint so deeply on our mind and so the the brain does do something with all the collected memories and all, all of our processing that's going on so that's really important it's reprocessing something it's processing something but turning off the part that we use to deal with the world to a large extent which is the front and it's also our more rational side so because we turn off all these rational um this rational front brain we lose the ability to understand what's going on and we lose the ability to call out dreams and i do wonder sometimes that is lucid dreaming the ability for you to switch back on some of these inactive parts during a dream and therefore act as a rational actor within a dream and that's why it can be so hard for you to to remain asleep when you first snap into lucid dreaming because your brain it thinks all right now this part of this part is on, is turned on the me part of the brain is turned on i should um i should wake up completely but if you can master that if you can wake up within your dream you're able to 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 live as that act active actor in the dream which is so interesting it's so strange so i do wonder i haven't seen any good research on that nonetheless but um this this is the important thing to understand and, and i'm going to go big a bit more into that visual center because it is profound what goes on you get all that information that comes in from the eye and it zooms all the way to the, the right at the back and that's the hardware hardcore visual cortex where like all that information goes and this is this is where you see so your brain is full of paradoxes like this the the front where the eyes are goes to the back the eye on the left is wired to the right and like you know that your right hand is wired to your left brain as well all these really strange things that go on 
and um, and even in fighting you'll know from mma if you watch it or boxing you're not allowed to hit people on the back of the head and that's because that's the the actual part that is so sensitive and um, it's got a lot of your your motor movements down here below and of course your visual cortex like if you hit someone hard enough in the back of their head they could um, you could damage their ability to see which is just criminal you can't be doing that whereas they don't mind you getting punched in the face as much which is interesting to say the least so it um your brain takes all this stuff and, and turns it into the back and it starts to um it starts to push this information forward towards the front of the brain so it's almost like your brain takes in the information from the eye and this is quite similar to how it comes in through the ear as well and it goes into this back of the brain where you process it all and then your brain begins to send it forward to the more frontal parts of your brain where what happens is your brain uses this information to do more active things in the world like speak or make decisions or react or think or, or, or move, you know, or judge, these type of things. So it starts off as your brain takes stuff in into the back and then it flows forward and gives you the ability to use it in some sense in the frontal parts, as they say. And this is, is of course, divided into a, a left and a right division that you probably know all too famously. So the front and the back one is not talked about as much, but the left and the right one is talked about plenty. In this right side, you have this conception of art and magic and and the, the more big picture way of seeing things and the, the super, super ordinate pattern recognition ideals and the way that it will make sense of what's going on in a broad sense to allow your logical brain to run free and and and, and break stuff down and be specific and um, even more useful in terms of acting so these two work in symbiosis and they do an interesting drama between them and so when we are dreaming what is of course interesting is that we do actually turn off more of our left brain and leave on some of our right brain things especially in regards to the language and whatnot so a lot of what you experience uh, when you're when you're dreaming about languages is not as literal as as people might see. So say say for example you see a person in a dream. When we wake up we're like oh my god I saw that person I was dreaming about them. But it it would make more sense that because you saw that person you were you were um, working with the more right brained interpretation of that person. So they probably were a metaphor for something that type of idea. You're using that way of of saying things. So you might bring up a person and use them as a metaphor. And this is um, something Jung discovered, which is you know obviously such a credit to the man because he did this intuitively without knowing it. That when you dream about a symbol, the smartest thing you can do is take that person or that thing and don't imagine that it's the real person and take it so literally and instead try to do this thing where you sit down with it and and flesh it out with a web of associations he would call this active imagination and if you do it extreme enough it gets weird but he would do this web of associations so say you see like your butcher or your your postman or something like that and then you would sit down and after the dream and you would you would think what's the first thing that comes to mind when i think of that postman and you can be like oh jealous of his really nice shoes and then it goes from i need to polish my own shoes oh i don't have enough for polish oh I, I i'm quite angry that i'm broke oh i hate my boss something like that and you bounce along these these uh, webs of association and that's the way you want to deal with dream language this is the language this is the architecture a dream is pulling out and so yes, instead of having this, this, uh, and this again is the, the language section, you have the Broca's area at front to do with speech, frontal, outwards, you have the Wernick areas at the back which to do with processing language, and um, listening, understanding, interpreting, and then of course these two are actually found in most people on the left hand side, exclusively, and on the right hand side they use it for the metaphors of language, the music of language, the patterns of language, the art artistic side of language. So these are actually turned off when you're sleeping, but the other side are, is more active, which is crazy stuff when you think about it. But um, what is more interesting, what is the, I guess the key is how profoundly charged the limbic system is. That This is your emotional and your memory centers. And this tells us a lot about what's going on here. This is a major, major dream pill, if you will. Um, as you're moving from this processing center towards the front, you have this thing called the temporal lobe. It's like this little wing that hangs out, like the chicken leg. If you can imagine, uh, uh, <laughs> if you can imagine a, a, a chicken 
a raw chicken as uh, as what your brain looks like. You've got those little legs that stick out at the side. That's sort of what the temporal lobe is like. And as they're moving towards the front, they they form into the emotional centers and then ring back around. So they've got a, a confusing shape. It's like the the bone at the top of the chicken is like the start of this emotional center that runs into your hippocampus, which is like a loop that goes back again into the very middle of the chicken and the middle and the front of the chicken. That was such a crazy metaphor. <laughs> and so uh, how this works is you have the hippocampus, which is this big looping thing that goes through your brain. And this is your memory creating tool. It's, this is an amazing machine, if you will. And uh, always take care of it. Alzheimer's eats away at this thing. So you know that this yoke is important. This is how you produce a, uh, a short-term memory and a long-term memory and you codify memories from short-term to long-term so if someone gets a damaged hippocampus what's interesting is that they will remember everything but they won't be able to remember new things and this tells us a lot about what's going on because in a brain in a dream in a brain in a dream you are experiencing quite a lot of your your old memories and your re re um rejuggling them and contrasting them with whatever new stuff you're getting as well and uh, right at this top of this hippocampus, at, at the very tip where the bone in the leg of the chicken would be, is your amygdala. And this is, the, this is a super, super important uh, thing. This is your, your fear center, or your, your fear anger center. This is your highly charged emotional center. You can imagine this as this like nuclear power plant or something like that. Or, or um, you could imagine it as the the the, the hyper dramatic, crazy uh, press of your your brain or something like that. They tell you when to be angry and shocked about everything. And so they sit at the tip of the hippocampus and they charge information going into the hippocampus. And so people have noticed quite extensively that whatever emotional state you're in will determine how much you remember. And if you're extre in extreme emotional states, you'll remember way more compared to if you don't remember anything at all. So well, like a trauma is when something happens to you and you're getting such a huge charge from your amygdala that you and it's it's extremely negative as well that you and um, you burn this experience into your soul and you cannot escape it it becomes like a a demon that haunts you in your dreams because this amygdala charges to its fullest maximum extent with fear and horror and and, and terror and then your your hippocampus codifies that experience and all the symbols related to it and the smells and everything is like this horrible terrible you know meeting with satan essentially and then you get trapped in in that dream in some sense and so all of this stuff is super active when you dream this is absolutely going wild beyond belief it's it's charged up because it does seem like your brain is pulling all of that stuff out of that old back at the reverse at the behind your head that um all that visual all, all that um all, the, all those old memories all those old associations all those old uh, visual scenes all those visual and i guess you can say auditory scenes that are from the back of the brain that you've processed and established as your memories and whatnot and comparing them with of course the, the new stuff you've had during the day and checking out how they've been charged <clears throat> how they've been charged with emotions and so this is an important thing because when you when you see something in the world and jordan peterson talks about this a lot you don't notice it unless it matters to you and you don't know if something matters to you unless it has an emotional charge so when you see a curtain you're probably like you could walk into your house and you're going to ignore 99.99 percent .99 of what you see and you're going to focus on you know walking over to your 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 phone because you're addicted or your computer because you're addicted or uh or your girlfriend because maybe you're addicted as well who knows but it's going to be some very specific things that you're going to do you're going to go towards these things and, and see them and notice them because they have emotional value to you whereas everything else will be like nonsense you won't notice most of the stuff all over the walls or you won't notice the nuances of the paint job that the the noble painter did that you don't even appreciate you you nasty bastard and it's that type of things like it, it's it's to do with the fact that you block stuff out and what you live in is not necessarily uh the, the reality you think you live in you don't live in some type of guaranteed objective world where you see everything you actually in many senses live in this giant dream of what you consider valuable and you literally blur everything out that's not important and this is in some sense true like your eye literally blurs out 
things that it's not focusing on and this is the, the metaphor that we're using here that you don't focus on these things and you don't focus on these things because they're not charged with emotions and so what the hippocampus and the amygdala do in their dance together is that they charge memories dreams and ideas with emotion and so when you are dreaming you are pulling all that stuff up and recharging and checking charges so your brain seems to be doing something intelligent and this is what i mean by the problem with the scientific the rational scientific sam harris perspective and stuff like dreams is that it's just nonsense that your your brain does okay i'm not sure if sam harris says that but you get what i'm saying like it's it's um it, the problem with that is that your brain does seem to this does seem to be an intelligence beyond belief that it's not you doing it it's not like your rational prefrontal cortex which is asleep right now this is where you don't experience dreams as you in some sense you you're not conscious the way that you are when you're awake and so it does all this for you and it charges everything and figures them out and tests everything out to make sure it knows what's going on which is just profound beyond belief it shows that it's smart and you could call this your mammal brain just above your reptile brain and it, this is indicating that it is in fact something incredibly intelligent that's working here that got you through millions of years of evolution and so this is what's this is taking center stage and it's working with that back of your brain to make sure you're processing everything right so what is it doing was always my question because it's obviously intelligent and it's obviously doing something quite interesting but why is this useful and um yeah, so the amygdala performs primary roles in the formation and storage of memories associated with emotional events. Memory consolidation, long-term memory, all these type of things. Yeah, fear conditioning, a type of memory that is impaired following amygdala damage is mediated in part by long-term potentiation. So, what it seems to me that is happening we'll have to get a bit funky here is that the amygdala the, all of this this stuff that's going on here is receiving charges from the body so this is how neuroscience seems to work is that your your heart and your your, your spine will send up information charges and um, up to power your brain to run your brain essentially it's like the the the, the energy centers for this and your brain will use this energy to determine to, and it will start charging your memories and charge your worldview in some sense. So try to make up the world around you out, out of how it should be charged, how you should value it, how you should feel about the world. So it's a very felt thing. And it's trying to unify this this um, position where you need to see the outside world and you need to perceive it correctly. It's almost like your brain is at war with reality because reality is always changing and chaotic and your brain has to figure out how to see it correctly, how to perceive it correctly, so that you, when you wake up and that front part of your brain comes on, is able to have all of this stuff and um, all this this more passive this more yin perce um, perception stuff sorted in the background you can wake up and and your brain can tune you into stuff and then you can spend your time not focusing on like what is this is this laptop really my friend you can more focus on your more rational stuff like what do i do with the laptop your decision making and whatnot so it's it's helping you out by rendering the the background by putting together your reality and in some sense you live in the matrix in a weird way because you don't necessarily experience reality you experience what your brain determines is important about reality and so your dreams seem to be you doing that for you like your your inner you doing that for yourself it's putting this stuff together it's trying to help you do that stuff and so um you have these deep emotional powers coming from the bottom such as your desire for you know lust and all that and these these highly powerful libido energies coming from the bottom are actually some of the main things that your brain needs to sort out this is why they're important this is why i'm bringing them up you know your desire for sex is is directed at the woman your desire for food is directed at food your desire for um safety is directed at gathering resources so all these need to be grabbed by your brain and they need to be categorized correctly so your brain needs to know that um all right how do i how does this deep urge for this deep desire to get women how should it be directed who how, who should i categorize as value valuable and it does it quite naturally like you're you're orientated towards beauty but say what's that like when you're married like how does that work or your your hunger 
like how do, how does that work am i supposed to change my diet am i supposed to learn a new diet like what's supposed to go on here how am i supposed to see that who do i trust this is where it becomes more profound then it's like you can talk about like the heart chakra if you want to get into this who do who do i categorize as my friend versus my enemy who's good who's evil what's going on there and so all this stuff needs to be sorted out and it in a huge extent needs to be sorted out in the background because if you spend too long thinking about this especially if you lived in the jungle you would have got eaten by the lions and so what your brain does what it seems to be doing is it seems to be putting together categories it seems to be categorizing and figuring out what's going on it seems to be grabbing the world around it and rendering and understanding what, what's happening and then doing all this stuff in the background so your brain doesn't you know receive this download and this mad information and um, operating system while you're walking around you can just think you can just think intuitively it's trying to make you be able to live intuitively and so it's trying to build a secret private mythology for you it's trying to put together your reality in the back of your mind that you live within so in some sense you live within a dream and if you want to take this even further when you get a, get a lot of people together and gather them in a society what they're doing is they're living in a dream together like when you categorize what is good and what is evil what is right and what is wrong that is the indication that people are in a dream altogether it's an indication that this process has happened on a large scale and people have decided to categorize you know a certain type of person as an outsider and them as insiders and a certain type of behavior is wrong you know even the think about the sexual question i was talking about the most fundamental energy is sex and then when you're in a society the attitude towards sex is one of the most dominant questions of all like look at victorian england they took sex extremely seriously and um, most cultures have their taboos about everything, you know. Those taboos are actually the secret indicators to the shape of the dream that they live in. And so, what is... And this is why the, the psychoanalysts like Freud and Jung were so obsessed with things like taboos and whatnot. It's because they're asking that question, what are taboos? What do the taboos indicate? When you have a personal taboo... What is that trying to tell you? Is that trying to show you the, the, the architecture of your personal dream? What about your cultural taboo? And is your cultural taboo matched with reality? There's an even bigger question. So if, you, if your game is to try update your dream architecture to match reality, what happens then if that clashes against your culture? What is, is your job to fix that, repair that, to update that? That's a big question. What happens when someone comes in, when your culture is not adapted to reality and they start to steal the minds of people towards their own dream? And this dream might be negative, it might be an evil dream. What do you do then? How does that work? And so the question and the, the answer, the, the question I was asking is, do these things have any purpose? Do they have any function? From looking into it, because it fascinated me a lot. It does seem to have something very, very profound that it's trying to do. And the ideas behind someone like Jung, as far as I can understand, was he was saying that you can help that process along by sitting down and essentially doing introspection. You can help yourself ask questions like, what, what should I categorize as right? What should I categorize as wrong? And your dreams tend to be churning up serious problems that you're dealing with at whatever time you're having them and so they're very good topics they're very good things for you to study to figure out what you're supposed to do like when you are um dreaming about a issue and you'll see this if you read your dreams for a long time that you'll have like a month where you're you've got a theme to it or a certain character keeps showing up and that means you're trying to deal with something your, your deep brain is trying to recategorize something but it's struggling with it and you can actually help that process along by, as Jung said, bringing it to consciousness and asking questions about it. And that's the magic that you can help this do. So as much about traveling to Mars might be romantic and interesting. If you want to talk about, you know, something that you can do long term that will get real effects. It's almost like the gym, something that you can do consistently that's not really that romantic, but but like you do it for 10 years you will see serious changes in your life the dreams have that ability where if you kind of just keep a touch on them and every now and again dip into them and, and look and say oh wow this is what i seem to be wrestling with right now it's my brain is trying to figure out how to reconceptualize this idea 
and and helping it along helping it update itself to to match that war it has with reality you can do some brilliant brilliant work and that is what Jung I think on on the most crudest and lowest sense meant by individuation he uses a lot of jargon but this is what I think he was talking about and I think it's a based way of looking at it and I do believe that it works as well if you can pull this stuff out you can skip steps in some sense if you can if you can discover how your psychology is biased and deals with taboo and and conceptualizes things it can can make you very very good at um uh, crossing over a lot of your bullshit and getting to the root of many of your problems and dealing with your reality and most importantly being able to understand if you should go along with your culture or go against with your culture how you should interpret your culture what you should do for your culture how do you honor your culture and whatnot living in your dreams so this is a a port an important skill an important tool and if you are interested in doing this or learning how to do this you can of course get in touch with myself or jimmy by hopping down into the email below and sending us an email and we will talk about a consultation if you want to work through this and we'll give you a hand and we'll see if we can help you update yourself to match and outcompete the matrix thank you very much for listening stay well peace out and boyo over and out <laughs>